Well, hello again. I thought we were done doing these online video things, and once again, we're back in COVID, and so we're going to do an online Bible study for a few weeks on Wednesday nights, so be looking back here at 6.30. Uh, if you're a longtime viewer of this, welcome back, and I'm glad that you're watching tonight, and if you're a guest kind of checking things out on our website or on our Facebook page, I want to say welcome to you and thank you for, for watching this video and we look forward to, to seeing you in person Sunday morning at one of our worship services at 10 o'clock. Um, we're looking forward to that. We know a lot of people get online and check things out before they visit and we encourage you to do that and we encourage you to, to check us out in person as well. I wanted to get on here tonight and, and just share a little bit of an update uh, regarding our, our COVID situation. Uh, we are uh, if you're a member, you've gotten an email about this. We are asking that everyone wear face coverings. We are checking temperatures at the door. Um, we are social distancing. We have our, our pews taped back off, so it's six feet apart. And in between those um, pews and also from side to side as well. And, and the reason we've done that isn't because we're like the mask police or, or we're all freaked out because the government's saying all these things. The reality is, is we've had about 10% of our congregation, or actually more than 10% of our congregation, have had a positive test in the past few weeks. So we wanted to take every precaution just to make sure that we're slowing the spread of this. I don't, I don't know if we're ever going to say we're past this or through this or um, it's gone or we're going to get rid of it. Um, but what we're trying to do is just keep a whole bunch of people all at one time getting it. Um, so that's kind of why we're taking these precautions for a few weeks, um, just to kind of slow it down at least a little bit and, and kind of keep it from just spreading like wild throughout our entire congregation. So since we had so many tests positive, we just kind of wanted to put the brakes on a little bit and uh, make sure we're, we're taking precautions and, and not getting, you know, all, all of us sick at the same time. Um, those of you that are Dealing with COVID, we're, we're sorry about that, and we are praying for you and hope that you're recovering and, and doing well, and we look forward to you returning and getting out of this quarantine and getting over this stuff. Um, I know a lot of you are annoyed, you're frustrated, you're tired of this. I'm tired of it too, um, but it's just going to be the nature of the game. Uh, looks like from this point on until something's, you know, until we're able to get rid of this thing completely, um, looks like this is kind of what we're going to be doing. It's going to be kind of on and on, you know, without mask and, and being able to do that for a little while and then having to pull back some as well. So that's where we're at. We're having to pull back. Um, we're watching what happens. School started back up. I know there's already some kids and students that have been quarantined um, through that. We're, we're just kind of watching the situation and seeing what we need to do. We're not really making any decisions until um, at later times about starting things back up. We're, we're shooting for August 22nd being the day that we're going to start back children's ministry on Sunday mornings. Um, also uh, starting up our life groups, all of them starting up that week, the 22nd. We're looking at that as kind of being the date, but we're also keeping an eye on things because we may have to adjust um, just depending on what this variant does and, and kind of what the information is. There's not really any guidelines out there right now. Um, we're just kind of having to feel our way through it, so I'd appreciate your prayers. Um, we're just trying to take precautions, be as safe as we possibly can to try to slow this thing down because we don't want, you know, 150 people being sick at the same time. Um, but we also know, like, we want to meet. We want to be together. Uh, we want to worship the Lord together, and we want to gather together and, and grow together. Um, and we know that we can't just stop living because of, of this disease, so... Um, I encourage you to take whatever precautions you feel that are necessary. We're still going to be posting our worship services online. They'll be live on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, so if you feel like you need to stay at home and watch those, feel free to do that. But if you're able to and, and you uh, feel safe doing it, we want to encourage you to be in person and be with us um, here, even though we have to wear masks and do that for a few weeks. Be here if you can, and uh, we'll worship together and I'm looking forward to that. We are going to social distance. It'll probably be a little bit longer that we're going to keep social distancing. Seems to be that's one of the most effective ways to kind of slow this thing down. So the tape will be up for a little while. Um, our welcome centers will be wearing masks for a little while. That'll stick around for a while but hopefully we're going to push through this one more time and um, we'll be able to get things back rolling in just a few weeks. 
So I wanted to share with you tonight just a, a brief Bible study. Um, since we're not able to gather on Wednesday nights or do life groups at this point, just wanted to get on here and, and share a little bit from the Word and encourage you as you're going throughout your week. I want you to think about the words that the culture uses to describe people that follow Jesus. So think about what the world would call people that go to church or people that, uh, who say, I, I believe in Jesus. The first word a lot of people think of is Christian. Um, another word uh, people think of is religious. Another moral majority or moral minority, depending on which way you look at that. Um, religious right. Um, I've heard that term thrown around a lot. You know, it's kind of unfortunate that we live in a world where um, religion and politics are so mixed together. Um, we're going to look tonight at what the Bible says. The one word the Bible uses more often than not to describe people that follow Jesus. And it's not Christian. It's not religious right. It doesn't have a political meaning at all. It's actually the word disciple. Now in English, we've got words that kind of have a dual purpose. Um, they can be a verb. They can be a noun. So like you say hammer. I could say uh, I have a hammer in my hand. Or I could say I hammered that nail into the wall or um, I'm hammering that. That's two uses of the word hammer um, is the actual tool that's a noun and then the verb, the act of hammer. Um, also, another word like that is milk. So you can go and say, I'm going to go milk the cow, right? That's an action. That's a verb. Or you can say, I have a glass of milk. That's a noun. That's a thing. So the word disciple is like that. It has two meanings. It's a verb and it's a noun. It describes who we are. We're disciples. We, we follow Jesus. We learn from Jesus. It also tells us what we do. We live a life like our leader. Um, that's what a disciple did. A disciple was someone that would follow a teacher around and try to live as close as they could to that person's life. And that's exactly what we are to do. We're to learn as much as we can about Jesus and then practice out his lifestyle. That's the word that the Bible uses more often than not to describe a follower of Jesus is disciple. Some people think disciple, well, that's someone that goes deeper than just a Christian. You know, a Christian just believes and then a disciple is like someone that goes a little bit deeper. No, the, when, when Jesus used the word disciple, it meant someone that believed in him. When the New Testament uses the word disciple, it means someone that believed in him. That's the word they all used to say, if you follow Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, you're a disciple. All right, it's not 12 selected guys. It is anyone who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ. So we're going to look tonight at a definition of what a disciple is. If you want to, I want to encourage you tonight to down in the comment section, whether you're on YouTube or on Facebook, to, to put what you think in your own words a disciple is. So kind of write out a definition of what a disciple is. So write that out and kind of post it there so we can look at what everybody's ideas of a disciple is. And then we're going to take a look at Luke 9, 23, and see what the Bible says, or actually Jesus says, about being a disciple. So if you have your Bible tonight, we're going to be in, in Luke 9, 23. Um, and I, I kind of go back and forth between this verse and Matthew 4, 19 as being the verses that define a disciple. They both kind of go together. Um, but I like this one a little bit better. It says, Then he said to them all, him being Jesus, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So that verse gives us four parts of what a disciple is. Uh, the first part that it tells us is it says, if anyone wants to follow me. Well, the first thing a disciple does is they want to follow Jesus. They make a choice and say, I want to pursue a relationship with Jesus. That's the first step in being a disciple. It's like uh, a dating relationship, you know, um, long, some of you, it's been a long time since you've dated. For me, it's been a long time since I've dated someone, even though I still try to date my wife occasionally. Um, back when Casey and I were first getting together, we hung out and went to a movie. Um, we went to dinner a couple of times, and then we had to have the DTR, the find the relationship, the talk. Um, and that talk went on for a very long time that night but we sit down and we had to say okay what what is this relationship and where are we going with it um, a disciple has to have that thought with jesus they have to say you know what this jesus thing what am i going to do with it am i going to pursue a relationship with him or am i going to leave it a disciple says i'm going to pursue 
a relationship with Jesus. Uh, the second thing a disciple does is that they deny themselves. Jesus says, deny yourself if you want to follow me. And what that means is we have to say, I want Jesus' will over my will. I'm willing to give up my personal uh, ideas, my personal wants, my personal desires for what Jesus wants. And boy, that has a lot of implications in it, right? We can think about ethics, the way we live our life. Uh, we want to live like Jesus commands us to live. Um, so there's obedience in this, but there's also uh, a bigger picture of this. Jesus said he came to save those that are lost. Um, that's what we're here for as well. Um, if we're going to live the life of Jesus, then we better be engaged in Jesus' mission. Uh, his mission is to go and make disciples of all nations. Well, we need to be involved in that and doing that. So uh, a disciple is participating in Jesus' mission. We're evangelists. We're trying to reach people with the gospel. Um, we're teaching others how to obey Jesus. So we've got to be active in his mission. Um, if we're following after him and trying to live out his lifestyle, that should be evident in us as well. So the third part of following after Jesus is taking up your cross. Now, the disciples knew when Jesus said this phrase, when he said, take up your cross and follow me, they knew that meant die. Uh, that meant a very excruciating, very painful, very horrible way to die. And Jesus is saying, you're going to have to die. Now, there's a couple of different ways that we look at this. First of all, you, you as a disciple, you die to sin. And the Bible over and over again, especially the New Testament, tells us to crucify our sinful nature, to crucify our sin, um, to put off our sin, to put aside our old self. Uh, it phrases this a lot of different ways. Well, one of the things Jesus is talking about here when he's saying, take up your cross daily and follow me, is he's saying you're going to have to die daily to sin. Uh, another thing that this means is you're going to have to die daily to selfishness. You're, you're going to want to come back to that, that second part and say, you know what, this is what I want, and this is what Jesus wants, and those two things don't go together, and there's going to be a tendency to go, I want to follow what I want to do. Um, but we have to die to that. We have to kill that off in our life and say, I want what Jesus wants. Um, so we're dying to selfishness as well. And then uh, Jesus is also saying, if, if necessary, you may have to give up your life physically. All these disciples that were here at that time, a lot of them had to give their life physically uh, for him. They realized they had found something worth living for, and it was also worth dying for. And that's how we should look at Jesus, too. He's worth living for. But he's also worth dying for. And, you know, that's something to think about in our, our world today. Uh, I saw a meme I uh, came across uh, a little while ago, actually. And it said, you won't die for your faith because you won't even show up to church for it. Um, and that's, that's really where we're at in our world today. Like, we are so comfortable and um, basically so prosperous, especially in our country, that we don't really need God. Uh, even in the church, we say, you know, we don't need Jesus, we really do need Jesus, and he's worth dying for. He's worth giving up everything for. And that's what Jesus is saying. When you take up your cross, you're saying, I don't have any rights. I don't have any, um, any claim on anything. I'm giving it all up. I'm willing to sacrifice everything, every relationship, all my, my stuff, um, all my power, all my prestige, uh, my reputation. I'm willing to stake that and willing to give that up for Jesus because he's worth every bit of it. So a disciple sacrifices themselves. They, they take up their cross. They, they say, I'm willing to die to myself, to my sin, um, to worldly pursuits for the sake of Jesus. And then finally, a disciple follows <clears throat> Jesus. Now, what it meant to follow someone in those days was the disciple would go around and they would literally follow their, their rabbi or their teacher and learn from him and they would try to mock as much as possible that lifestyle. Um, whatever their, their, their teacher did, they would try to do as well. And that's exactly what we should do. As followers of Jesus, that's what we're to do. We're to look at Jesus' life and try to mock his life, or, or not, not really mock, but to live his life in our shoes. Um, we're trying to emulate his life um, as we go about our life, um, whether we're at work, whether we're at school, whether we're at church, whether we're just hanging out with someone, we're at rest, we're recreating, whatever we're doing, our life should be trying to show um, and look like Jesus and how he would live in our shoes. So those are four things that a disciple does um, and who a disciple 
Yeah, so as we kind of wrap up tonight, I just want you to think about, one, are you a disciple? Um, a lot of people have a lot of religion, and they've been in church for a long, long time, but have you really followed Jesus? Have you really said, you know what, I want a relationship with him, and I'm going to pursue a relationship with him. If, if you haven't done that, or you've just been a part of the church, or, or you've just um, kind of done the religion thing for a long time, maybe tonight's the night you need to, to, to get before God and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, and I need to turn from my sin, and I believe that Jesus is the rescue for my sin, and that he rose on the third day and gives me hope for a future life, and I commit myself to the Lord for this point forward. Tonight, tonight you do that. Um, you can comment on here or you can contact the church and say, hey, that's something I want to learn more about. Um, but then also I want you to think about if you are a disciple, I want you to, to think about and to list, you know, get down a piece of paper or, or right there on your computer or on your notes, on your phone, write out some ways that you can learn about Jesus' life, how Jesus lived life, and then how you can practice it. Um, so list some ways that you can learn about Jesus. And I think that's one of the biggest things. We think discipleship, which is this process of becoming a disciple, we think discipleship is all about information. You know, you, you really look at the way a church has been structured for the last 50 years. It's all about education. Um, it's all about knowledge, uh, memorizing a bunch of verses. You know, if you were um, somebody in the church when I grew up, you, you memorized tons of verses. You did the Bible drill thing, um, all that stuff. That's not discipleship. You can, you can know the Bible up and down and, and be lost as an Easter egg. Um, discipleship is about practicing a lifestyle. And that's what we've got to get through our heads. It's not information. It's not about retaining information. It's about practicing a lifestyle. And that lifestyle is Jesus' lifestyle. So instead of trying to remember information, we're practicing the life of Jesus. So I want you to think about ways that you can learn what Jesus did how Jesus reacted in certain situations, how Jesus lived his life, how he got away sometimes and spent time with the Father, how he showed love to other people. I want you to think about those things and, and write down ways that you can learn how Jesus lived. And then also write out ways that you can live like Jesus lived his life when he was on earth. So you think about those things, and we will see you Sunday morning at 10 a.m. I hope you have a great week. Stay safe. And I'll see you very soon.